States-China relations in the age of Obama. And our guest, as you know, is Professor Lampton of the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, who is recognized as one of the leading authorities on, on China and uh, its foreign policy and uh, specifically the relations with the United States. Professor Lampton is a graduate of Stanford University in political science. <clears throat> Early in his career, he taught at Ohio State University, and I mentioned to him, I can't help but smile every time I think of that, because if you watch the introduction to the NFL football games, the players all say, the Ohio State University. And I think it's the only university that has that particular preface. Um, but not everybody here watches NFL ball games, obviously. The uh, Professor Lampton has uh, been a president of, uh, president of the, uh, the U.S. Committee on China-U.S. Relations. Uh, in the past, he's headed China Studies at uh, the American Enterprise Institute and the Nixon Center. He's aw been awarded honorary degrees, of uh, honorary doctorate by the uh, Institute for Far Eastern Studies of the Soviet Academy of, uh, of Sciences. And he's been a, uh, named an honorary uh, fellow, senior fellow, by, uh, in American Studies by the Institute of uh, Social Science Studies uh, in China. His, uh, the centerpiece of all the awards he's gotten, of course, has been his serious research and study uh, of China. His, uh, he's written or co-edited uh, or co-authored at least 10 books on, on China, uh, starting over three decades ago, 1977. He's been writing on U.S.-China relations for well over two decades. The books are all interesting. They cover uh, almost the full panoply of what's uh, of primary interest to us. Um, he's written extensively on the internal political processes in China, uh, the leadership processes, the questions of policy making and policy implementation. He certainly has touched on the, the, the I shouldn't say touched on, dealt with uh, the great issues of the day such as Taiwan. And uh, he's dealt with uh, U.S.-China relations. And he's examined the reach of, the global reach of China's power. Uh, one of the most fascinating of, of questions today and really the subject of his most recent, uh, most recent book. We uh, are extraordinarily fortunate to have someone who has for so long so seriously and enthusiastically and effectively uh, dealt with the subject matter which we're dealing with tonight. Professor Lampton, it's a privilege to introduce you. Well, that was a very gracious uh, introduction, and I'm very appreciative of it. And um, I'm mindful this is uh, maybe at least the third time that I've had the honor to speak to this audience, and it's an audience I enjoy speaking with because I can count on good questions and challenging questions. And so we're going to try and divide the time in half between uh, talking head, a monologue up here, and a dialogue with all, all of you. I do. Um, I want to say, I, as I was preparing for this lecture, I always like to, <clears throat> particularly when I'm in a, uh, a different a political jurisdiction, I like to find out what the economic relations are between China and, in this case, so I'll say the state, state of Maryland. And there's a wonderful service provided by the U.S.-China Business Council that has a map of the United States, and you can disaggregate it right down to congressional districts and find out imports, exports, relations with China, and so forth. So I went to that database, and you all may be interested that, um, first of all, China is the number two export market and trade partner for the state of Maryland. Uh, last year, in 2008, the, the statistics tend to run behind, uh, Maryland exported $570 million uh, to the People's Republic of China. If you look at the rate of growth of trade between Maryland uh, and China, you'll find that between 2000 and 2008, uh, trade with Ch exports from the state of Maryland to China went up 605% in that 2000 to 2008 period. You're exports as a whole to the whole world 
went up only, I say only, 140%. So China's growing basically five times as fast in terms of your exports uh, to China as your overall export growth. Uh, so long and the short of it, it would appear that China is a very important and a increasingly important part of the economic future of this, this state. And I've been traveling a lot, and I, as I say, I do look at this for all the states. Um, uh, many of the states, uh, some of them have a, a growth rate of 1,000%. Uh, some are only two or 300% over this period of time. But it is the, the relationship with China, China is the United States and has been for a number of years the most rapidly growing export market for the United States. And so when you sort of wonder why does the United States um, um, it more carefully balance its interests now. It is in one sense, and there was a ar fascinating article in the New York Times today about the rapidly growing consumption of the Chinese people from automobiles to refrigerators. Last year they bought more PCs than Americans bought, just for, for example. So this is all being uh, reflected, and I was interested in what the products that Maryland uh, exports, your number one sort of category, trade category of exports is uh, primary man manufacturing metals and metal uh, fabrication and so on. But it's, it's a manufacturing uh, industry that's uh, important here. Also, I would say just in the past, it just so happens idiosyncratically, I've happened to have the opportunity to interact with, uh, well, one of your former senators and one of your current for, uh, senators. Uh, Senator Sarbanes was very interested uh, in China, went, so I went uh, at least on a couple of occasions I can recall, to China with him. He spent a lot of time <clears throat> thinking about that. And Senator Mikulski has been involved uh, in programs that the Aspen Institute runs with respect to China as well. So your <clears throat> representatives in the Senate have, I think, are, are mindful of these interests and uh, seem to be as, as best they can spending time learning about that when they're not battling about health care and all the other things that are obviously on their minds. <clears throat> I think this is a great time, a great day, really a, a wonderful opportunity to talk about U.S.-China relations and China's growing role and what it, it means for the United States. Uh, if I think just uh, earlier this week, the Co Copenhagen uh, meeting uh, began on global climate change. And if you're reading the uh, papers uh, today, yesterday, and I will guess through what we anticipate will be President Obama's trip to Copenhagen around, I guess, the 18th, uh, you're going to read a lot about the dialogue between the United States and China. And it's, uh, I would say, and I'll get back to it in, later in my talk, but it's heating up. And I was quite struck uh, by the uh, rhetoric today. The Chinese uh, foreign ministry uh, representative on climate change for the Chinese uh, basically was admonishing the U.S. that you better search your soul for <laughs> essentially a good policy here on climate change, and you're not there yet. And the and the United States a representative, a man named Todd Stern, basically was saying, we don't owe anyone reparations for the CO2 that's already in the atmosphere that the industrial world put there. So this is heating up. The Chinese are actually adopting a more in-your-face, I guess the American might say, uh, approach at these meetings than has been their customary uh, keep their head low approach. Uh, so I invite you just over the next two weeks to, you will see a concrete demonstration of the character of the U.S.-China relationship as well as China's changing role in the international system. And the uh, Chinese are, I would say, playing a more assertive, uh, I don't mean aggressive, but certainly assertive role than we're we're uh, uh, that we're accustomed uh, to seeing. The other thing <clears throat> that makes this an interesting time to be talking about U.S.-China relations, of course, is last month's uh, trip by President Obama to China. That was his first trip to China, although in many respects he is our first Asian, uh, Asian president in the sense that he grew up both in uh, Hawaii and Indonesia and traveled extensively in South, uh, particularly South Asia, before he ever entered politics, had an early experience of living in an Asian society. We have had other presidents, Herbert Hoover, just 
president of Stanford and obviously president of the United States. I didn't mean to put that in the wrong order uh, there. Uh, but in any case, he was a mining engineer in China. So we've had some presidents with a, a quite substantial uh, interest and involvement in China. But I think it's fair to say President Obama probably has a more intrinsic, in-depth, visceral kind of sense of, China, of, of Asia. Uh, than uh, any other president we've had. And I want to talk just a little bit uh, towards the end about uh, how one might evaluate President Obama's trip, uh, because I think it's fair to say the, the press was pretty critical. Uh, there, were, it was, there was some differentiation, but the president didn't get what I would call great reviews from the mainstream media in the United States. Interestingly enough, in Asia, he got very good reviews. Uh, and so it might be interesting to ask why that would be the case. But tonight, I thought I would at least set the stage for that, our discussion by asking uh, really three questions, trying to address three topics just briefly. One is that how can we conceive of the U.S.-China relationship uh, as a, uh, I think we can conceive of it as a difficult management problem. And what are we trying to manage? I think we are trying to manage a very rapidly uh, rising power uh, in a circumstance of interdependence. Uh, that is to say, we have certain insecurities about what China's rise means for us. And when I say us, I on the one hand mean Americans, but I think Asia has its concerns, the rest of the world has its concerns, and at the same time we see great opportunities and it, frankly we increasingly need each other. And so one of the problems in this relationship is going to be ma managing this sense of competition, anxiety on the one hand, and extracting out the cooperation and benefits that we can have through an intelligent management of this relationship. So I want to talk just a little bit about what the difficulty there might be. Secondly, I want to talk about the uh, fact that I think the strategic foundation for U.S.-China relations is stronger than it's ever been. Uh, and that, that should be a surprising statement to some people. If, uh, but I think uh, if you look at the evolution of U.S.-China relations, certainly since Nixon went in 1972, we have a more fundamentally sound relationship than we've ever had before. Uh, and, but there is, and this is the third point, there is a but in this sentence, and that is, at the same time we have a more fundamentally sound relationship than we've ever had before, we're going to have more conflicts, I don't mean necessarily military conflicts, but certainly conflicts of interest and policy and preference than we've ever had before. And this relationship is going to be just one continual treadmill of bargaining, grinding interests one against the other, half a loaf outcomes. Nobody is going to be very satisfied most of the time. So strong relationship, lots of problems. And of course, given the nature of our press and our society, you hear a lot more about the problems. But it's good to keep in mind, I, I, there are many people in this audience as old as I am uh, who remember the old ad about Timex watches. Timex watches take a licking and keep on ticking. And in a sense, I guess the U.S.-China relationship is a little like that. Pretty durable. Uh, I think we, it's strong enough to withstand us pursuing uh, our interests. Well, let me uh, just proceed through those three points just briefly to kind of outline where my thinking lies, and then we'll, we'll uh, proceed to questions and answers. I said I thought this was a difficult relationship. To, to, it required management because on the one hand, we have a growing China, and yet we're very interdependent with it. We both need each other, and so we're kind of ambivalent somewhere between anxiety, a competition, and the recognition we need to cooperate. Uh, and I would start by commending to you, I don't normally recommend people read government reports, they're pretty dry and boring, but you can go onto the internet and look under www.nic, National Intelligence Council, 
uh, uh, Global Trends 2025. It's the, it was the, in the last um, a couple of months of the Bush administration, the Intelligence Council, National Intelligence Council, the sort of collective body representing the informed view of the intelligence community of the United States, issued a report in which they basically said power in the world is shifting away from the United States towards Asia, in particular China and India. And that while the United States for the foreseeable and a distant future will remain the single most powerful country in the world by most measures, uh, we will be much less or increasingly less dominant in the future than we have been in the past. That is to say, it's at least the assessment of our intelligence community then, and it's been, that assessment's been adopted by the current administration in testimony to the Senate Foreign Relations Commu uh, Committee uh, by Admiral Blair, the new director of national intelligence, who essentially had the same analysis, that the United States is strong, will remain strong, but it'll be less dominant. That is to say, less capable of commanding uh, people uh, are going to be in lockstep. If their interests are divergent from us, they are in fact going to pursue their interests with a greater feeling they can be independent of the United States. And you can see this in Japan now, and the argument over bases in Okinawa is just one example. But the South Koreans feel increasingly empowered to move in directions of their own interests, even if it's not our particular preference. So one of the problems in managing this relationship is the U.S. role in the world is changing uh, in, I don't want to say becoming weaker, but becoming less dominant in the world than we've been since 1945. And that's going to take some adjustment. Uh, and on the other hand, we all in our memory, most, uh, many of the people in this room, myself included, can remember when the characterization of China was the sick man of Asia. So we've got this dual problem of management of the Chinese are feeling their oats. They're moving ahead. When I intervene, the Chinese, they feel perfectly free to articulate their interests and say what we are doing wrong and what they want us to do differently. And on the other hand, so we're a little, uh, I think, insecure and back on our heels looking at this trend. China's rising, and this, I think, is one of the uh, trends that make it um, a, a sensitive uh, issue about how we're going to manage it. Secondly, a very interesting poll uh, came out by the Pew organization, Pew People in the Press. They uh, conduct a periodic uh, international or cross-national uh, polls, and they, uh, just the last few days, one came out on the attitudes of Americans towards a f foreign policy. And they ask, they've asked over the years the, pretty much the same questions, so you can see how attitudes change. <clears throat> but their bottom line was the U.S. is becoming much more, the populace of the U.S. much more focused on our domestic problems, as you might, might well expect. And, uh, and I'm not even criticizing that. I'm just observing that. But in any case, uh, several dimensions are really quite striking because they bear on how we are going to manage or the kind of support we can expect in managing our relationship with China. One of the questions was, do you think the United States should mind its own business? In 2001 and 2002, uh, basically about 30% of Americans thought we ought to mind our own business. I guess the other 70% presumably thought we ought to mind everybody else's business. I don't know what the, the flip side of that was. But it was a, a fairly um, a substantial part of, of our population that um, uh, thought we ought to exercise influence in the world. Now, in 2009, in November, 49% of Americans were willing to say we ought to mind our own business. So a, a, a greater inclination not to be telling other people, I guess, uh, what to do. When asked, do you think the United States ought to be involved in democracy promotion? In 2002, that was, uh, remember, when President Bush gave his second inaugural address, uh, uh, or 2003, that era, where democracy promotion was a very big part of the picture. At that time, 44% of Americans thought American foreign policy ought to be really pushing a democracy. Now the figure is 10%. That is to say, 90% of Americans don't think we ought to be doing that, whatever that is. If you say, okay, uh, do you think the United States ought to be involved in defending human rights? 
43% at the beginning of the 2001, 2002. Now only 21% think we ought to do it, which means approximately 80% don't think we should. How many people think we ought to be involved in foreign aid and improving the standard of living of the developing countries? Used to be 37%, now it's 18%. So the, the long and the short of it is that at the same time we're becoming less dominant, we're also, it appears, our population wants to be less involved, interventionist, expending resources, put it any way you want. I hate to say isolationist because I think that uh, is probably an overstatement given our involvement all around the world, but nonetheless, Part of the problem in managing this relationship is in the past we've pushed priorities, human rights um, uh, uh, among them, democracy and so on, and the, uh, we've been pushing the Chinese, they've been reacting and suddenly maybe we're going to be pushing them less and uh, we'll see what that uh, produces. At the same time, China's strength has really been moving up impressively. So at the same time, we're kind of seem to be uh, psychologically withdrawing to some extent, or at least a little more modest in our ambitions, uh, the Chinese are really moving up in the power indicators. And I'll just give you one, but we could uh, talk about many. Um, if you look at the period really from, let's say, 1840 to 1978, China controlled about 3 to 5 percent of global GDP. That is to say, 25% of the world's people had not more than 5% of the global output. That is to say, until 1978, China was a really poor place. And now, once Deng Xiaoping came in, got the reform program, globalization, special economic zones, I was talking to a gentleman out in the lobby who's been dealing with Xiamen. It was one of the first uh, special economic zones in China. But from 78 on, China's been moving up that percentage of global GDP, and depending on which figures you look at, and there's a somewhat of an argument about this, but if the Chinese revalue the RMB, that figure is going to jump suddenly overnight, but somewhere between 11 and 15 percent of GDP. So they started 30 years ago at, let us say, 3, 4, 5 percent of global GDP. They're somewhere between 11 and 15 percent now, and their ambition, I think, is to get back to their historic level before the last hundred plus years of about one third of global GDP. So the Chinese are moving ahead. They've made a lot of progress, but they got a long way to go. Uh, but this, you know, if you think about it, what are people afraid of? What, what kinds of things create anxiety? And I would say big things that are rapidly changing that aren't very transparent. That is, we don't know exactly what's going on inside, but it's moving fast and it's big. And China is all of these things. So you've got this, this situation of us with our attitudes and our circumstance and China moving ahead. And I think it would be rather surprising if there wasn't mutual anxiety. And I say mutual anxiety because I think we're worried about the power equation, but the Chinese are worried are we going to seek to try as a matter of policy to slow them down? As we become more anxious, China becomes more concerned that maybe we'll become more protectionist. Maybe we'll become less liberal in transferring technology to China and so forth. So I would say just broadly speaking, uh, we have uh, a management problem at that level. But it, we can't allow that to drive the relationship entirely because why? because we need each other on the other hand. And i just give you a, a few ex examples of that. Uh, certainly, 25% of China's exports still come to the United States. No country wants to write off 25% of its exports. So the Chinese uh, need us. On the other hand, with this huge trade surplus that China has, it's accumulating dollars like crazy. And what is China doing with these dollars? They're loaning them back to us, and we're glad to have them. I mean, glad in quote, end quote, because we are stimulating our economy with deficit spending. We're financing two wars with deficit spending. And frankly, the Chinese, along with the Japanese and the South Koreans, are financing our excessive, at least deficit, spending. So 
No surprise, Mrs. Clinton, uh, Secretary Clinton, on her first trip to China in February, essentially asked the Chinese to keep buying U.S. bonds. Uh, I, I, in another context, I'd, I would say I was a little nervous about indicating that degree of concern to the Chinese. First of all, because the Chinese aren't doing it as a favor to us, this isn't philanthropy. They're putting their dollars in U.S. instruments because they believe that's the best place to put it. But on the other hand, it is true, given our deficit spending and uh, desire to keep low interest rates and keep economic growth at least going in a positive direction, uh, we are two scorpions in an economic bottle. And the Chinese have dumped so much money into the U.S. dollar, their holdings are in excess of $1.6 trillion. You know who's most worried about the falling dollar? The Chinese. And in fact, that's their single, probably their single biggest sore point with us is we bought all these expensive dollars, and now because of your expenditure pattern, you're driving down the price of value of these dollars. So the Chinese sound like the Republican National Committee, you know, lecturing on fiscal solvency. So you have a, 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 a need there. Certainly climate change. China is now the number one emitter of CO2. We're the number two. Uh, we can't solve this problem unless the United States and China agree. That's just simply the, uh, the truth. Of course, we have India and a lot of other countries that have to make contributions as well. Uh, cont contagious disease. Um, you know, think about, you know, in some sense, a, a lot of these viruses from time to time have had their origins in, in Asia, Southeast Asia, China, Southern China, and so forth. Uh, in this case, the Chinese were pretty worried about the swine flu that uh, seemed to have its origins not in China, but it, I guess, if I'm not mistaken, Latin America and, and so forth. So, but the point is, these are global globally circulating diseases, and we need to cooperate. And in, in, in 2002, 2003, I think it's fair to say China did not initially cooperate with the world uh, public health community very much until they saw how serious the problem uh, was. So long and the short of it is, we each have our anxieties and mutual suspicions with one another. I could talk about our competition in space, cyberspace. There are many zones that we're competing in, uh, I would say, in somewhat worrisome ways. But on the other hand, we need each other. And we've never had a relationship, I think, quite like this. I mean, we're used to thinking about a relationship, but we have, we have a relationship with Britain. And it's essentially, we have our competitive aspects, but basically it's a uh, fairly uh, 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 compatible uh, relationship. Or we have a relationship with the Soviet Union, and in its own way, that was pretty clear too. It was totally, uh, almost totally uh, competitive and adversarial. With China, there are strong elements of both. And that's what makes this, I think, difficult uh, to, to manage. Uh, a second point that I said, and I said that I thought you should be a little bit uh, surprised by the way I put it, that I said that the relationship with China is really strategically, in terms of its foundation, the strongest that we have ever had enjoyed in our bilateral relationship, at least certainly since Nixon went to China in 1972. And what leads me to say that? Uh, if you think why Nixon went to China in 1972, the answer is to effectively oppose the Soviet Union. That was the basic reason uh, he went. And that rationale served us pretty well uh, until 1989 when the uh, uh, Berlin Wall began, uh, fell and the uh, Warsaw Pact collapsed, and then in 91, the Soviet Union imploded. But by 1991, the issue then really was, well, with the Soviet Union gone, what's the rationale for good U.S.-China relations? Why we, we have now economic antagonisms with China, where Tiananmen had happened in 1989. So suddenly, with the Soviet Union gone, people that were unhappy about the economic relationship said, well, you know, the Chinese don't trade fair. Uh, people that were unhappy about the human rights situation just had to point to global TV and CNN on June 4th, 1989, and they rest their case. So, I would say in the 1990s, we didn't have a very clear uh, uh, foundation for our relationship. We had economic interests, but those were slugging it out in the U.S. Congress every year with the human rights 
uh, uh, set of uh, concerns about China. So President Clinton, particularly in his first term, uh, I think, frankly, didn't know whether he was more inclined towards economic interests or human rights interests, and we kind of floundered. He f began to find his way uh, in his second term, uh, and he landed on economics as the rationale. It's the economy, stupid. Uh, he finally landed there. So I'd say basically in the 90s and into 2000, uh, and, and uh, certainly till uh, September 11th, uh, we essentially had what was hold the glue holding this relationship together was economic self-interest in both countries. Then 9-11 came along. And adding to that economic interest that had um, evolved, we now had a security interest again. Remember President Bush, George W. Bush said, you're with us or you're against us after 9-11. And Jiang Zemin, the then president of China, was, um, let's put it this way, very astute. He understood, I think, the motivations, concerns of President Bush, and he was one of the first people on the telephone and said, President Bush, we're with you. And so once again, we began to cooperate on anti-terrorism, counter-terrorism. I don't want to exaggerate it. We can go into it in questions if you're interested. But once again, like Nixon had used the anti-Soviet, now Bush could get a new underpinning for this relationship in security. And that's important. Counter-proliferation, North Korea, Iran, uh, Afghanistan, Pakistan. China has better relations. I'll say better in quotes. They're complicated. But better relations with many of these countries than we do. And we want China to help us in dealing with these problems. So that certainly, 9-11 basically uh, strengthened U.S.-China relations. And then you have President Obama come along, and I think he's very much thinks of the world not only in the economic sense and in the counter-proliferation and terrorism sense, but he also thinks about the world as an interdependent place in terms of global climate change, health issues, and so forth. And so, as we are, we'll see this week and next, uh, he's placing a lot of importance in the U.S.-China relationship of dealing with these global issues. So, that's why I said, in a way, I think this relationship is stronger than it's ever been, because it's grounded in a desire both in China and the United States for stability. Stability of the global economy, stability of what you might call the global ecology broadly conceived, and uh, stability in uh, security sense. China and we see many of the problems the same way. But this gets me to my third point. But we don't see the solution to the problems the same way. So that's why I was saying the strongest relationship we've ever had, but we're going to have more fighting with the Chinese than we've ever had. In part because we're dealing with them so, so much more intensely, and partly because the problems are becoming bigger, our capacities are less, their capacities are more, and we want them to use some of that new capacity to solve the problems we care about. As you might understand, they occasionally will have different priorities among these problems, or they will have uh, different ideas about how to solve those problems. So strong relationship, big problems. So that gets me to the third. What are some of these problems? And I'll just tick them off, and then we'll, we'll go to Q&A. Take climate change. Why is the Chinese representative Yu Ching Tai uh, from the foreign ministry uh, telling Americans to search their soul for what the, their responsibilities are on global climate change? Broadly speaking, in these negotiations, the Chinese want to, if you imagine a, a graph, they want the line on uh, absolute volume of CO2, the amount of CO2 they can emit, they want to go up. Now, they are offering instead of the line going up at some rate like this, they are offering to push that line down. The average Chinese emits about four tons of CO2 a year, the average American 20 tons. So the Chinese view is, until we're as rich as you, we ought to be able to grow and, and, and get at least some of the economic welfare that, that you, the developed world, enjoy. So the Chinese are not willing to see that, to push that line in a downward slope. They're willing to try and 
push that line down, but on still ever increasing base. The United States is talking about the need for everybody to actually reduce the amount of CO2. So Chinese see a line like that, we see a line like that. Now the obvious solution, and frankly the one, broadly speaking, I think makes a certain amount of sense, but not political sense, is we probably, if we have an agreement at all, it's going to look something like this with the U.S. agreeing to absolute reductions and the Chinese and the Indians and uh, lots of other developing countries being permitted to increase CO2. But you try to sell that in Congress or to the American people. Why should the Chinese be able to, in effect, uh, we're reducing and paying a price to do so and they're filling it up with newly generated increasing volumes. That's going to be a hard sell in the U.S. Congress and probably among the American people, I would guess. So, but you can see why the Chinese would want to do that. They're at a much lower level, uh, and uh, for, certainly in per capita terms, and they've got, in order to maintain political stability, they got to grow economically, and to grow economically, they got to use energy, and China's 70 percent dependent on coal, and that emits a lot of CO2. So you can understand why we are where we are, but that doesn't solve the problem. So that would be just one example. We need each other, but we have different interests and it's not clear how this is going to get resolved. Just take another area, counterproliferation. The Chinese say, we don't want nuclear weapons in North Korea, and they don't. As one Chinese put it to me, with friends like the North Koreans, who needs enemies? <laughs> so they have a finely honed understanding of just how difficult the North Koreans are. So they, it's not that they particularly love and adore the North Koreans. Uh, they don't want them to have more nuclear weapons and they like to see them have none. But in the end, the Chinese don't really think the North Koreans are gonna use them. The Chinese aren't as afraid of the North Koreans having nuclear weapons. So they agree they'd rather the North Koreans not have them, but they are not willing to undertake the strong arm methods that the United States would like them to undertake, economic sanctions and, and uh, maybe even pressure of a, even a coercive type. Uh, the Chinese are not willing to do it. And why aren't they? Because the Chinese kind of like having a little buffer zone there between a U.S., uh, let us say, allied South Korea, and they don't want that coming up right to their border in North Korea. They like having a pliant, uh, well, at least a dependent buffer state on their, their border. Now, so you get in these endless discussions, yes, the Chinese don't want the North Koreans to have nuclear weapons, and then we say, okay, you ought to use your influence on North Korea to help produce that result. And the Chinese are very reluctant. From time to time, they've done some things. We could go into it if you wish in Q&A. But basically, the US is quite frustrated that on the one hand, the Chinese agree with us, but they're not doing as much as we'd like. Same story in Iran, where China has literally probably over 100 billion in contracts and, uh, and uh, agreements uh, for uh, investment in natural gas and oil and refining capacity in Iran. And so, yes, we don't think the Iranians should have nuclear weapons, but the issue is what is China prepared to do in pursuit of that? And bombing the uh, nuclear facilities in Iran is not in the Chinese playbook. And you, th you move to another area, global economics. Chinese want the global economy to go along, this is uh, to grow, this is, they share that interest with us. And they've had a stimulus package that's twice as big in percentage terms compared to their economy as ours. I mean, they pulled out all the stops to keep their economy going. And that's, if you just look at the business page of the New York Times today, you'll see that it's been a major engine pulling along much of the world economy. So what the Chinese have done in many respects in this global economic downturn has been um, you know, good for everybody, at least in terms of growth. But this creates a problem. They want us 
to manage our economy in a way that is in, uh, in their interest. They're worried about the global uh, decline or the decline of the dollar. Uh, they also are worried, as I mentioned, what the value of all their dollar-denominated assets are, are going to be. Uh, they want the United States uh, to, in fact, uh, continence a retreat of the dollar as not the sole dominant or the major dominant currency in the world, but move towards a basket of currencies. And that basket eventually is going to include, in their view, the RMB, the, the Chinese dollar. And of course, we've benefited enormously by having the US dollar be the dominant global currency. So long and the short of it is you just go area by area. Uh, we've got important interests with the Chinese. We agree on the big, big picture. But what we don't agree on is all the steps necessary to move towards those big picture objectives. Let me just end by just saying two things that will sort of be the segue into questions about um, President Obama's trip. I mentioned that, I, and I'm not a flack for the administration. I'm not a partisan person. Uh, in fact, I think you'll see that uh, as I conclude. Um, but President Obama's trip, I think, got a kind of raw deal in the press. That's the way I would put it as an opening statement. Because I think the press set up a, a, a sort of a set of standards for success that were probably not the goals of the trip in the first case, and were totally infeasible in the second. So there's a sort of game before the president's trip, specify the objectives. The president goes, doesn't achieve those objectives that were never the administration's. And then you say, see, he didn't achieve the objectives. This dialogue, engagement, you know, uh, uh, it's, it's futile. Well, uh, I don't think that's a very fair uh, take, although I think there are some, some problems. I think fundamentally I would say the trip did what we can expect. If you believe this is an important relationship that's difficult to manage, but we're interdependent, if you believe some significant fraction of what I just said, then it's important that the heads of our two countries talk from time to time about how we can manage our common interests and work around all the areas we disagree. I mean, do we really think that the Chinese are going to buckle at the knees every time a president of the United States shows up in their capital? If you don't believe that, you can't expect that. So that, I think, ultimately, I think, the, this business about presidential trips is creating a situation when we have problems in the relationship, in a sense that the leaders know each other, that at least there's some basis of rapport and uh, human contact that allow them to more effectively deal with the problems than they would be if they'd never met, dealt with each other, and so on. So you might say that's a modest expectation. It is. But as I said, this relationship is going to be a treadmill of grinding interest and conflicting interest. The relationship's going to keep taking a licking like that Timex, but, and it's going to keep ticking. But you have to have this engagement, I think, to, to allow that. Also, I think there were some, were some tangible gains. For instance, as far as I can see, they issued a, an agreement on November 17th, or I should say joint statement. <clears throat> it was, I believe, the longest such communique ever issued after a presidential vi visit to, to China. It was a joint statement. We agreed to a, quite a number of things there, but I would just point to two that I think are actually, uh, or three things, quite significant. One is, never before uh, have, uh, do I believe a President of the United States has agreed to that it would be a good idea to have cooperation with the Chinese in space. This has been a very sensitive area. We've been, had space cooperation with the Soviet Union when they had 20,000 missiles aimed at us, but we can't seem to get space cooperation with the Chinese when, you know, max, they have uh, 45, literally four or five, uh, that are even uh, capable of, of hitting us, at least uh, in flight. So uh, the, the mention actually twice in this communique of the desire to have space cooperation I thought was interesting. Frankly, I'm not sure we'll actually do much in pursuit of that, but I thought that was interesting. Also, there was a significant agreement on energy cooperation, joint research. We're going to put in both sides, uh, I guess, 75 million each, total 150 million to look at new clean uh, te energy technologies uh, and so forth. I think that's a, a positive uh, kind of thing. Uh, 
Also, I think the Chinese came to a more realistic understanding, and I think it, Americans need to have a, maybe a more realistic understanding of the dangers in Iran. And in fact, before President uh, Obama went, he sent two envoys over to China to uh, tell uh, the Chinese, I think they, this is, these are my words, I'm not purporting to quote, but uh, the, the clock is ticking on Iran here. And that is to say Iran's moving ahead. Uh, you, you Chinese may not think Iran in and of itself is a danger, but let us tell you this. If the Iranians get nuclear weapons, well then, you have to count on the Saudis getting them and the Egyptians. What do you think? The, the Middle East that you now depend on for, you, well, China's about 40, 50 percent dependent on oil imports and about half of its oil imports come from the Middle East. Do you want, you know, 25 percent of your oil imports dependent on a place where there's a nuclear arms race of a really, um, let us say, unpredictable character? going on. And indeed, the Chinese uh, did support the recent action of the International Atomic Energy Agency with respect uh, to Iran. So long and the short of it is, I think this trip did accomplish some things, and probably some of those things we're not uh, fully aware of, but the ones we're aware of, I think, are uh, certainly justification for the trip. But largely, I think this baseball box score of, you know, Chinese two, Americans one, we lose. That kind of mentality, I think, really doesn't get at the core of what this is. And this is now a garden where you tend it every day. This is the relationship. You don't see big progress. It's just an evolving uh, situation. Thank you very much for your attention, and I look forward to your questions. Well, we thank you for a most interesting presentation, a very nice framework uh, for Q&A. Um, I'll repeat the questions, sir, in the rear. Given the complexity of yeah. the, the place that Japan occupies in its own yeah. thinking and in ours, um, is there a consideration of the interests of Japan which is really relevant to the mm -hmm. Chinese uh, relationship to the United States? Yeah. Uh, well, key question, and of course, Japan itself is undergoing some evolution. Um, I think it's fair to say that with the long reign of the LDP, Liberal Democratic Party in Japan, there was a certain um, um, long uh, understanding between the United States and Japan. And now, as you've got the Japan Democratic Party and Prime Minister Hadayama, he essentially ran on a proposition of distancing him, Japan to some degree. And I don't think in his campaign uh, rhetoric, he necessarily had an idea of what that degree was, but there was some popularity in Japan represented in uh, his party's election uh, uh, to the idea of distancing somewhat from the United States. And, uh, uh, you know, what, then the question is, well, if you're distancing some from, from the United States, who do you think you're moving closer to? Uh, and I think, in some sense, that's answered when you consider uh, that China is Japan's number one export market now, not the U.S. So you begin to just, uh, as I started with the Maryland trade figures, you can start doing that for countries. And what you find is the United States allies, the Republic of Korea, number one export market, China, Japan, Taiwan, most of Southeast Asia. So. Asia's developing a mind of its own that reflects. Now, if I left it at that, you'd be rather, I suppose, negative about the prospects for U.S. influence in the region. The, everybody in Asia, and I would say the Japanese, and you can look at their polls, they're worried about what China's growing power, economic and military power, means for them. And so, most of Asia is trying to get the economic benefits of a close relationship with China and yet hedge their bets by keeping the U.S. in the region strong in a, both an economic way and a military way. And so you find ambivalence throughout Asia. They want to get the benefits of, of a growing, rapidly growing China. Uh, on the other hand, that rapidly growing China creates anxieties, and they want to keep the U.S. in the game to, as one Indonesian uh, strategist put it to me, he said, you know, 
we Indonesians, we don't want your, you, you Americans, meaning our troops, we don't want you in our house, meaning we don't want you with bases. But what we do want you to do is be out on the sidewalk in front of our house providing security. Now you could, of course, understand why the Americans might be ambivalent about, you know, that, that kind of uh, uh, phraseology. But the long and the short of it is, uh, Asia is not trying to push us out, but what they are trying to do is be able to get the best of both worlds. Economic benefit from China and security benefit and economic benefit from the United States. So we're going to find less pliable allies. And we can see this in one way. We've seen it actually in two ways in Korea in a very short time. We're seeing it in Japan. Uh, and this is just going to be what I referred to as the management problem. People are going to follow us because what we suggest is in their interest, not because they have to. Are you concerned about an arms race yeah. with China? <laughs> uh, yes, I am concerned, uh, but not. I, I, I'm much more optimistic it can be managed. But if you say, am I concerned? Yes, I am concerned. And I just uh, give you, I, I would start by saying, I hope we don't go down this road very far. I think it will not be in the region's interest, our interest, China's interest, or the world's interest if we do. But you know, wishing doesn't make it so. And there is potential. Uh, I, I think one of the biggest problems in U.S.-China relations is what I would call mutual strategic suspicion. The Chinese are not sure, for example, that they have a secure nuclear retaliatory force. They've now just fielded some new ballistic missile launching submarines. I think they're feeling a little better about the security of their retaliatory force. They have very few nuclear missiles that are capable of reaching the U.S., and the U.S. could even use conventional weapons, theoretically, to take out missiles in fixed silos and so forth. So the Chinese have been trying to build their nuclear force, make it more modern, mobile, put it out to sea so we can't find it and destroy it in a preemptive attack, which the last administration uh, issued a nuclear posture review that had a portion that pertained to China that was very worrisome to the Chinese. So you can look in the nuclear area, but I think the Chinese are nowhere. I don't think in their wildest nightmare would they ever develop what the Soviet Union did was at the height, 22,000 strategic weapons or something of that order. Chinese, I, I just can't imagine that. But we could go down a road in that direction that I think wouldn't be good for either. Uh, and indeed, uh, I think when the president was in China, they talked about uh, renewing our di strategic dialogue, a portion of which deals with these kind of issues. Just uh, two other examples, though, of the potential here. Um, certainly cyber warfare. The Chinese have been doing a lot because the Chinese strategy is essentially to say, look, the U.S. is dependent on a uh, on computers, information retrieval, the whole information network. It relies for sensors on satellites, our weapon systems, you know, attacks on Al Qaeda in in Pakistan, you know, from Langley. This kind, and the Chinese therefore are trying to think how they can disable those systems if they're directed at China. And so, for example, this means anti-satellites. Well. About, what, two years ago, the Chinese shot an aging satellite out of the sky. I think it was in February 2007. We weren't expecting that. The Chinese had tried to do it, I believe, on a couple of previous occasions and had failed. I guess we had the happy thought that they would continue to fail, and bingo, they did it. Well, this potentially brings at risk your, your global surveillance system. I'll give you another example, the, G, uh, the, the sort of um, global GPS system that's you know, the backbone of, of um, global air transportation, American-run system. The Chinese don't, you know, but, but the Chinese missiles, for their guidance, m might need to rely on that, and the Americans have the key. If we got in a crisis, would the Americans continue to provide us the service to, uh, to uh, guide our ships, planes, and whatever uh, in counter response? So the Chinese are developing their own independently run uh, global uh, positioning system. Um, so you've got uh, all of that, that kind of thing going on. And then you've got cyber uh, uh, capability where the Chinese are trying to you know, be able to penetrate government networks, banking systems, power systems, and so forth. Uh, incidentally, I believe 
without any classified knowledge whatsoever, I assume we're doing the same thing. So there are, uh, there's, there's competition going on that may not be entirely um, evident to the average person, but if this got out of hand, and I don't know operationally what I mean by out of hand, but if it went in, it's going to be expensive, and we're going to in the end find we're all spending more money so we can all be more insecure. And I, I take that to be kind of futile because the Chinese are not going to not respond. Uh, that, that I'm sure of. If the dollar indeed got stronger, uh, how would that uh, impact our relationship with China? Uh, I'm probably mixing my cultural metaphors, but the Chinese would be popping champagne corks. Uh, I mean, they have 1.6 trillion in uh, dollar-denominated assets, so the degree to which the Chinese appreciate commercial success, and let me assure you they do, uh, that would go a long way. Also, you have to ask, why would a U.S. dollar be appreciating? And that would mean, ultimately, I look at current uh, currency exchange rates as sort of a vote, a relative vote of a confidence. Who has the soundest policies? We feel uh, uh, confident in holding their currency over a long period of time. And so my view is a rising dollar signals the world, in a sense, voting uh, in, in a kind of very direct way about whose policies they have confidence in. And I, if the dollar was rising, I assume general, on a, you know, a long-term trend, that would mean the U.S. was making decisions the world uh, felt more comfortable with. I presume it means that maybe our trade deficit would be going down, maybe our budgetary deficit would be going down. Those would be decisions that ultimately would strengthen the United States over the long haul. And so my guess, and if I believe anything about the Chinese, is they respect power. And right now, I think, think they're 100% certain about our future. Uh, I don't mean, I'm not trying to sound apocalyptic, but we're talking about degrees. And I think the Chinese are less certain than I wish they were about our long-term health. And uh, so I think in some sense, if the dollar went up, you'd have... Um, you, you, you have a lot of these management problems I'm talking about, but let me put it this way. Uh, I'd like to, I think that would be helpful to our position if our currency was basically perceived to be stronger and, and so on. It, you the know. last speaker, uh, Mr. Forbes, oh? you know, it seemed to indicate that he thought our dollar, you know, we kept the dollar artificially low. Um, that we should have a strong dollar policy. So I guess that's that, just what I said. So that it's just, uh, but Mr. Forbes has made money and I haven't, so <laughs> take, his, take his word for it. But if we, uh, <laughs> I guess his dad made a lot too. But, yeah, um, yeah the, I think we're on the same page. My, my major job is to note the time and make sure we get out of here at the proper hour and that our speaker is, uh, uh, is allowed to go. And I've gotten caught up in the moment. And uh, it's been an absolutely interesting time. Um, I had to even put my glasses on to make sure it really was as late as it is. We've exceeded our time limit. I apologize to everyone, but it's been such a marvelous evening. Thank you so much. Thank you.